Okay, thanks. So this is, uh, this is a joint work with uh, Noga Alon, Noam Nissan, and Ran Raz. Um, and as Tony said, um, kind of the philosophy of this talk is uh, to understand the, the impact or the role of interaction and information in, in uh, economics. So the, the motivating story for this talk is uh, the so-called economic calculation problem is um, one of the most fundamental questions in economics of how to determine an efficient allocation of the economy's uh, resources. So the traditional view of this question was as a, um, a pure optimization problem in which the central uh, planner needs to compute um, a welfare maximizing partitions of uh, the market's items in a way that um, yeah, given the, the valuation profiles of, of the agents uh, in the market. So for example, <coughs> the Ministry of Health would like to allocate um, doctors to, to hospitals. And the computational complexity of this problem um, was studied for uh, almost 100 years, and it's interesting on its own right. Um, in fact, it's a major open problem, uh, major problem in algorithmic game theory uh, until this very day. But what this uh, problem formulation uh, was missing, as pointed out in the uh, seminal paper of Hayek in, uh, back in 45, was that <laughs> the the central planner does not have the, the inputs for this problem, right? So the valuation profiles are actually dis distri privately distributed among um, uh, uh, the players. So each doctor uh, knows by himself individually what's his own uh, preference list. And this, of course, is not known to the central planner. So how could he ever uh, optimize uh, the welfare if he doesn't know uh, the inputs to the problem? And kind of Hayek's uh, philosophy or suggestion was that indeed the, the real bottleneck of this problem is not the computational one, but rather the information theoretic one. So uh, Dobzhinsky, Nissan, and Oren recently proposed a formal model for studying this uh, uh, Hayek's uh, uh, question in philosophy uh, in terms of round communi versus communication trade-offs um, in the multi-party communication complexity model. And kind of the philosophy of their work was to try and give a mathematically formal assertion for Hayek's prediction that a market-based economy is better than, um, than a centrally planned economy by virtue of, of uh, allowing for interaction um, among the, the market's players. So uh, the simplest model in which this question can be posed is that is that of uh, uh, unit demand uh, bidders or just a matching market. In this simple setup, we have n, a set of n bidders. Each one sees his own, has his own demand set of, of edges, so just m bits of, of information, whether I'm interested in this item or not. And we should think of m always as being linearly or polynomially related to m. And unit demand means just that uh, each player is happy as, so long as he receives any item of this set. So uh, no, no differences between items. This is really the, the simplest settings of combinatorial auctions. So in this uh, setup, finding a welfare maximizing allocation is nothing else but finding a maximum or near optimal matching in a bipartite uh, uh, graph. And we'll be interested in, in doing so uh, using a limited uh, number of interaction uh, rounds. So just a little bit more motivation about this problem. Obviously, so what this paper or work is really about is, is, um, is about round versus communication trade-offs for finding near, near optimal matchings in a bipartite graph. Clearly, this is, this is a very basic problem whose scope goes uh, much beyond the uh, economic uh, uh, motivation, which was the direct motivation of, of this work in the, the previous one. And in the DNO paper, it was also suggested that this, this question, in particular for the bipartite matching problem, is related or at least potentially related to other uh, models of computation. For example, to space lower bounds uh, in multi, multi pass streaming algorithms, to parallel and distributed computation, in which uh, 
uh, the, the quest for, for kind of a deterministic low communication parallel algorithm for distribu distributed matching is a, is a long-standing open problem. It was suggested that somehow studying this problem in the communication model can even bring computational insights into the, the pure computational problem of finding um, a maximum matching in a bipartite graph for which the best uh, known algorithm is the 40-year-old uh, Hopcroft uh, CARP algorithm. And <clears throat> improving this n to the 2.5 to anything better than that is a, is a, is a, huge, uh, is a huge question. So this is as far as, as philosophy and motivation. So uh, what's the formal model? We use the number in hand uh, multi-party communication model with a shared blackboard. So in this model, each bidder is modeled as, as a player. He receives his own inputs, which is just m bits of information, whether uh, I have an edge to this, whether I'm interested in this particular item or not. The market dynamics is modeled as just an R round, um, a fixed round or a bounded round communication randomized protocol with a shared blackboard. So the way the communication goes is, as follows, at each round of communication, each player is allowed to write at most B bits on the, on the blackboard, and the players speak simultaneously. That will be important uh, for, our, for our proof and analysis. And of course, the message of each player at each round only depends on his own private input, the content, the history of the blackboard, and possibly some private and public uh, randomness. So, any questions about the, the model? Are players competing or cooperating? No, no, and this, so it's, there is no, so that's a good question. So there is no kind of mechanism design here whatsoever. So the, the goal is completely, um, it's a joint goal of computing, just informing the central planner of uh, the least amount of, infor I mean, using a minimum communication to inform the central planner so that he's able to output a, a good solution for this optimization problem. The, the no individual. Everyone is interested in maximizing the society's welfare. And, and actually, this is almost without loss of generality, but this is a mechanism design question. So let me not uh, get into this. If you force the players to report in some way, this is without loss of generality. So by the end of the Rth round, when the protocol terminates, the central planner, which is just, uh, you can think of him as, as the referee, he's, um, he needs to just to compute uh, a set of, uh, just uh, to output a set of pairs, or just to compute to output a matching, which is solely determined by the content of the transcript, or the blackboard. And we say that a protocol pi obtains an alpha approximation to the optimal matching for alpha larger than one if uh, the expected size, or if it's a randomized protocol, then just the expected size of, of the matching of this protocol outputted by, by the referee is at least one over alpha times the optimal matching in G. And I want to stress here, I just want to remark that we will allow the protocol to be erroneous, so it might output uh, disconnected pairs of, of, of uh, uh, bitter item uh, uh, pairs, and we only ch we only count the legally matched pairs. We'll be interested in lower bounds, so this assumption only makes our our lower bounds stronger. So even if the protocol is allowed to make errors, uh, our result uh, will apply to this more permissive model. And <clears throat> so at this point, the the natural question is the following. So for a fixed bandwidth, suppose we fix the bandwidth, which is usually determined by somehow by, by uh, nature of the protocol, what is the optimal approximation uh, ratio of an hour round uh, protocol? So Dobzhinsky and Sun and Oren showed that using only logarithmically many bits in each round, one can obtain an n to the one over roughly r approximation. In this bound is obtained by the, the really most natural protocol in which each player just at each round reports a random, a random item in his demand set which was not already taken. And the intuition being is that you know, reporting a random item minimizes the collisions, which is the only bad case for the protocol, right? The bad case is where Ankur and I report both the same item and then 
one of us has to lose. So um, this uh, and the question here is also considering like length R augmenting paths through R rounds is. Uh, so what do you mean by? That's fine. Okay. Maybe I'll ask later. Yeah, so. yeah. So the intuition really is trying to minimize collisions. As long as we don't collide in a in a round, then both of us will will be allocated. Again, this is unit demand. So all we care about is is being allocated some item. And this result implies, in particular, that the market will converge to a constant. Uh, I mean, the pro any protocol can obtain a constant factor appro approximation using only uh, logarithmically many rounds and logarithmic bandwidth. Um, uh, so this is an upper bound on the uh, rate of conver the the equilibrium kind of rate, uh, uh, so to speak. In terms of lower bounds, they proved uh, a lower bound only for simultaneous protocols. So any randomized protocol that uses just one round, so any simultaneous protocol, cannot obtain more than a square root n um, factor approximation, even, even if, if players are using uh, uh, a slightly polynomial bandwidth. So, um, but this is. Uh, was the, the lower bound was, uh, was known only for one round. And the natural question in this point is, can we do better using any number of fixed rounds? So in other areas of, of uh, TCS, it is known that you know, even two or four rounds, even a constant increase in the number of rounds can sometimes gain uh, potentially a lot. And where it was pointed out in the DNO paper that e it was even open whether a two-round protocol can find an optimal matching, an exact matching, or, or a constant factor matching um, uh, using uh, even, I don't know, logarithmic uh, bandwidth. So even that was, was, was open. And we answered this, uh, or at least partially answered this problem by proving a lower bound on any fixed number of rounds. So we show that even if players are allowed to use a polynomial size bandwidth in each round, the approximation uh, factor of any R round protocol is no better than n to the 1 over 5 to the r. So there is a polynomial loss for any fixed uh, number of rounds. Uh, it also implies uh, the first uh, super, super, uh, super constant uh, rate of convergence on, on, um, on the market to equilibrium. Of course, there's still an exponential gap to the, to the, um, to the optimal upper bound, but um, at least we know now that uh, a super uh, constant number of rounds is required. So uh, in order to describe the proof, so the way we're, we're aiming for, for a lower bound for uh, a lower bound for randomized protocols, so the first thing we need to do is define a hard distribution. The way we, in which we do this is we design a family of hard distributions for any fixed number of, of protocols. And we do this recursively. So in all of our definitions, all our families will have NR bidders and MR uh, items, where MR and NR are, again, uh, polynomially related. So the base case of the uh, recursive family, namely uh, for R equals 0, so for, for zero communication protocols, uh, our hard distribution is constructed as follows. So there are N0, which is uh, equal to M0 bidders, so there are b to the 5 bidders and b to the 5 um, uh, items. And b is, again, I remind you, is the bandwidth. And think of it just as a formal parameter now. We will see that it will be uh, related to the, the number of bidders. And then, and the set of edges is obtained just by selecting you know, the natural dis hard distribution, just a random permutation. It's easy to see that if the players are not allowed to communicate at all, then the expected uh, number of matched edges of a zero communication protocol will be constant, or just one edge, right? So that's easy to show. On the other hand, every instance in the support of our hard distribution will always have a perfect matching. So the number of matched edges in the optimal solution will always be n sub r, which is the number of bidders. So this concludes the, the hard distribution for, for the base case. How do we define um, mu sub r plus 1 for, for any uh, the inductive step? So our instance is constructed as follows. We will have n sub r to the 4 
uh, bitter blocks, which we call bi, each of one consisting of n sub r bitters. So remember, n sub r is the number of bitter, bitters from the previous distribution. So in our new distribution, n sub r plus 1 will be n sub r to the, to the fifth. What about uh, the set of items? So the set of items is constructed um, into two partition into two sets. We will have a so-called a hidden item block for each one of the bitter blocks. So we will have n r to the to the fourth um, hidden blocks. And we'll have an extra smaller set of something like b times n r squared set of fooling blocks. And the name is, is suggestive, and, and we will see in a second um, uh, why is it so. Now, what is the set of edges in this graph? So we connect each block b i to its hidden block, which is, you should think of it just as a random, just hidden uh, index using a copy of the previous distribution, mu sub r. This is well defined because each block contains n sub r um, uh, um, bidders, and each block of items will contain m sub r items. Okay? So each block of bidders is connected to its hidden block using an independent disjoint copy of the previous distribution. And it's further connected to each one of those b times n squared fooling blocks. Does that make sense? So each, each block of bidders is connected to the hidden block using a copy of mu sub r, and to each one of those fooling blocks using a copy, an independent copy, of the distribution mu prime sub r. What is mu prime? Mu prime is just the product of the marginals of mu sub r. Okay, and this, this will be important. So what is the product of marginals? Mu sub r has always its projection on, on any bidder of this block, right? So the way it's, it will be crucial that each bidder here, the, ed, it's the edges of each bidder to the, the fooling block will be independent of each other. Okay, it should be kind of intuitively um, uh, understandable that marginally for each bidder, and no bidder can distinguish between his set of edges to the true, the hidden block, or to the fooling block. Because marginally, just by construction, a bidder will see the same image, the same distribution. Okay? So, what's, so in general, what is the intuition here? The intuition is that if all the players cannot distinguish the, their hidden graph from the fooling graph, then most edges reported in the first round will be from the fooling block. This block, the number of items in this portion of the input is much smaller, while those blocks will be the only way to obtain a perfect matching. So, so, any, so the intuition is that little information will be revealed in the first round about the true blocks, and there, from there on we can continue uh, recursively. So if this construction will, be, uh, will become hopefully more, um, uh, more formal as we go on. Just notice that, I want to notice already here that uh, the fact that we chose n sub r plus 1 to be a polynomial in n sub r already implies that in terms of b, just unraveling the recursive relation, we get that the number of bidders in the rth instance, or the r plus 1, grows doubly exponentially in, in R, and this is the cause for our suboptimal approximation ratio. So, um, and we will see that this is necessary, at least for our argument, in order to ensure that indeed little information is revealed about the true block in each round. So this, is, uh, this will be important. So just some other important properties we will use in the proof. So, let me just fix a little bit of notation. So let J sub I denote the random index of the fooling block of each, of each, uh, of each uh, hidden uh, uh, graph. And let's denote by G I J the induced subgraph, just the induced set of edges uh, between the block B I and the, the graphs uh, T J. And similarly by G uh, U J, the projection of this induced graph only on the bitter U. So it's just the the set of edges from bitter u to the uh, graph tj. And finally, just to avoid confusion, let's denote by g, j, i, the hidden graph, the edges of the, the, the true graph, the hidden graph. So in this terminology, the input of any bitter u in block i is just, is just the set of induced graphs on all, 
the BNR squared plus one blocks, right? He's connected to one hidden block and to the rest uh, of the fooling blocks. So again, as we said in the, in the previous slide, just by construction, we know that um, the set of in, just by observing a set of edges, no bidder can distinguish between you know, the, hidden, the, the edges of the hidden graph and the fooling blocks because the induced edges on the fooling blocks have the same marginal distribution on this bidder as the hidden graph. Okay, so that, that will be crucial. And therefore, the mutual information between, just by observing his own input, no bidder can know anything about the hidden index uh, uh, J. And kind of two uh, may, uh, lemmas that we heavily use in, in the proof are, these are just uh, two, two lines of applications of the chain rule, assert sufficient uh, uh, terms or condition under which conditioning uh, increases or decreases information. So the first claim says that the mutual information between two random variables, A and B, can only increase if we're conditioning on uh, independent information, so to speak. So if C provides new information uh, about B, or if A and C are, are independent, conditioning on C can only increase the information. On the other hand, if A and C are conditionally independent, condition on, condition on B, then conditioning on C can only decrease the information. So in particular, uh, we will have the following corollary. So the input of bitter U, of any bitter U, the mutual information between the, uh, uh, the input of bitter U and the rest of the bitter's inputs or the <laughs> bitter's prior to U, condition in, on the hidden graph is zero, right? Because we said that, well, GJI is the hidden graph. It correlates the inputs. For example, it contains a perfect matching. But the rest of the edges to the fooling graphs were chosen independently. So they are completely uh, independent. And using claim two, we have as a corollary that the information that bidder uh, use um, uh, input provides on the hidden graph is at most, uh, is, is at least this information conditioned on the, uh, the, the rest of the bidders. In other words, conditioning on the rest of the inputs can only decrease this uh, information. And this pr property will be, will be important. So the main theorem we prove is that for any R, we prove this uh, uh, inductively, for any R, uh, the expected matching size of any R round protocol with a uh, polynomially small bandwidth is at most five uh, N R to the power of one uh, minus uh, one over five to the R, which implies our lower bound, right? The graph, any graph has a matching of size R, this will imply a N to the uh, one over five to the R lower bound. Right, so the way we do this is, is by induction on R, and let me try to, how much time do you have, so? Six more minutes. Six. Okay, let me try to just give the gist of it. So for once and for all, let's just fix uh, an R, R plus one round protocol. So we're, we're gonna analyze everything with respect to mu R plus one, assuming that the theorem is correct for mu sub R. So let's fix any R plus one round protocol pi with um, <coughs> bandwidth at most B. And let's denote by M sub B I the, uh, the message, the first message of the protocol. Uh, in, the, in the first round of pi, and m sub u to be the messages uh, of the corresponding bitter u. So I won't really have time for this. Let me just say uh, what's going on here. So it's not too hard to show using subadditivity of mutual information in the marginal indistinguishability property that individually, every bit, the message of each individual bitter on the hidden graph conditioned on the, the hidden index is very small. It's like one minus um, the size of the block squared. This is, um, this is not enough because we want to show that the total uh, message of the entire block provides on the hidden graph is small. And in information theory, it's easy to cook up examples where you know, k bits reveal zero information individually, but somehow altogether the information is, is super additive. Um, but luckily, we have the property from the, the previous slide. 
And using the fact that conditioning on the, the previous messages can only decrease the information, um, plus the data processing inequality, we can assert that the information provided by the entire block of bidders um, on the hidden graph is at most the number of players in the blocks times what each player individually reveals. All right, so the conclusion is that the entire information provided by any block BI on, the, on its hidden graph is going to be much smaller than one bit. And using Pinsker's inequality, this means that in expectation over the first round of communication of the protocol, the original distribution of the hidden graph, which was chosen to be mu r, is very close to the distribution conditioned on this message. So the message doesn't reveal much. And this, is, this will be at most, let's say, square root of, uh, uh, of 1 over an r. So in particular, this is, um, these distributions are very close. So this suggests kind of a, a direct sum-based round elimination argument, which I'll only uh, mention briefly. So what's the intuition? The intuition is, is as follows. We know that conditioning on the first message of the protocol doesn't change the distribution of the hidden graph by much. So what the players can do is they can just um, take the R plus 1 round protocol, somehow sample the first message of this protocol using public randomness, wasting no communication at all. And they know that this message doesn't change their, the input of the, uh, of the hidden graph by much. And then they will just execute the remaining R rounds of the protocol on their, uh, on their input so as to produce a large matching under the distribution mu r of their hidden graph. Does that make sense? So the problem with implementing this, this um, round elimination argument is that unlike the two-party settings, in the multi-party settings, we cannot simply project, we cannot simply execute the protocol pi, which has r plus 1 rounds, because pi receives a much larger, our instance scales with the number of rounds, right? Pi operates over a much larger set of, of players, a much larger set of inputs. So in order to kind of project, in order to embed the distribution, in order to embed a graph according to mu r in the higher dimensional r plus 1 dimensional protocol, we need somehow to embed and sample the rest of the inputs to this protocol. So what the players really want to do is they want to take an instance for mu r and they ha somehow need to complete this input so that it's, it's a legitimate input to the R plus 1 round protocol, and only then can they just execute the protocol. And I won't say much about this, but the main problem is that, so remember, each bidder here is a private, he has his own private set of edges, but we know that um, the edges to the fooling blocks, um, Okay, let me say this uh, this way. They have to somehow complete the rest of the input so that it's sampled according to the distribution, the higher dimensional distribution, conditioned on the input graph and conditioned on the first message. The main problem which, with this kind of sampling is that somehow conditioning on the first message of the protocol correlates the private inputs of the players with the remaining inputs of that that needs to be sampled. So I don't know if this, so this, this problem, these type of problems occur in kind of parallel repetition and direct product uh, theorems where conditioning on this event, it's not hard to, to cook up an example that shows that the first message may, con may correlate the private inputs of the players with these inputs. In other words, if player number seven wishes to sample these edges, he needs to know the, edge, the private edges of player number two as well. Because his, the first message might be, let's say, the XOR of these inputs with his own private input. So somehow this conditioning really, it seems like it's impossible to bypass this problem, right? Remember, we want to sample these inputs with no communication at all. And so this is generally impossible. What saves the day here is the fact that the edges to this graph are chosen independently. So what we show is that since we chose the edges to the fooling graphs in mu sub r plus 1 independently, the only types of correlation that are being created by conditioning on the first message 
are local correlations in the sense that the, the edges to the fooling blocks of any bidder in this uh, set um, only depend on the content of uh, MI in his own private input, the own private input of, of this bidder. So the way we formalize this is using some conditional decomposition lemma. And again, this is, ignore the details, but what we show is that the, the joint distribution of those fooling uh, graphs decomposes into the product of the marginal. So this is only the private input of, of, of each bidder. But let's just uh, end this here. And so we prove this is the main uh, recursive lemma that we, we prove. And this, this finishes the, the, this allows for this. So I just want to say that this lemma allows to perform the, the direct sum argument that I alluded to not using only public randomness, but using a combination of both public and private randomness. So let me just mention uh, two uh, open problems. So the obvious open problem is to close up this, this gap on the rate of convergence. So our intuition is that this random trivial protocol should be uh, the right answer. It's hard to imagine something better than that. Uh, but I think it will be really surprising if if one could show that uh, log log n actually <laughs> naturally appears there. Um, another uh, direction is actually generalizing this proof or this lower bound technique into the more general, into more general valuation profiles. So in the general combinatorial auction setting uh, is somehow more appealing for communication, pro uh, for round communication trade-offs because in the general combinatorial auction setting, describing just the valuation profile of, of a player to each to the set of items requires two, two to the n bits to encode because he has a valuation for each subset of, of the items. And therefore, you know, in this model, additional rounds might ha have the potential of reducing communication from an exponential number of bits to a polynomial. And indeed, Dobzhinsky, Nissan, and, or, uh, and Oren show that if the market is subadditive, so for subadditive bidders, using R rounds um, can be, uh, is sufficient to obtain roughly a R uh, times M to the 1 over R approximation. And once again, their lower bound is only for simultaneous uh, uh, protocols, so the natural, que uh, you know, the natural next, que next step is to try and uh, prove lower bounds on more more complicated uh, valuation functions. Thank you.